Hi and good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm just uh, double checking that you can all hear me. So if you can type in the question section uh, so that we can proceed. Yep, okay, that's cool. So uh, hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar on the impact of COVID-19. One of the webinars that we are bringing to you, hoping that you are all safe and staying at home. My name is Hiba Abbasi, and on behalf of the University of Manchester Middle East Center team, I would like to thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm very pleased to be joined today by our guest speaker, Robert Willock. For those who don't know Robert, Robert is the director of the Economist Corporate Network based in Dubai and covering the MENA region. Robert works closely with regional business leaders to help inform their business strategies through political, economic, and operational insight and connect them with their senior leadership peers. Robert is a business analyst, editor, and publisher with 25 years of experience in Europe and the Middle East covering a wide variety of sectors, including hospitality, retail construction, energy and transport, and has a particular interest in human capital management. He has organized many conferences and roundtables, recruiting and prepping speakers and panelists, and is himself an accomplished event chairman, moderator, and presenter. Recent highlights have included staging a conference on privatization in Riyadh, chairing sessions at the World Ocean Summit in Abu Dhabi, speaking at a cloud computing event in Doha, and moderating a senior leadership roundtable in Dubai. Robert completed an MBA at the University of Leicester School of Business in 2012 and holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Nottingham. Robert, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, um, perhaps the first thing that I want to ask that in light of the current situation, and as the scope of the COVID-19 pandemic continues to take shape, we can only imagine its significant impact on our community of private and public sectors, including business leaders and owners, local governments, corporates, and SMEs. What is the current state of the pandemic, particularly in the Middle East or the MENA region, and how are the local governments preparing for it? Thank you, Heba. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, those are the big questions. Uh, they're questions that we're certainly being asked um, quite frequently and quite regularly by the senior leadership of, of the regional business community. I will endeavour to answer some of those questions for you here today. Um, there are a lot of facts and figures abounding about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, many of those are changing uh, by the hour, if not the day. Uh, and I have uh, some figures uh, in today's presentation, which I will share with you. Uh, so uh, a bit of a caveat, a bit of a health warning on those. Um, they are as, uh, as up to date as I can make them, uh, but things are changing quite rapidly. And I think it's probably worthwhile taking as a given that any risk to these figures is likely to be on the downside. Um, so, um, Let's uh, let's have a look at, uh, at how 2020 began. Uh, it seems like a very long time ago now, doesn't it? Um, and it was already a tough start to the year with a particularly difficult economic and political environment. We were already reporting slow global and regional growth. Not so long ago, all we were really talking about in terms of major risks to the global economy was the US-China trade war. Uh, of course, that still remains a significant risk longer term, but there were other issues as well clouding the horizon. Um, the assassination of General Soleimani um, pitched the US and Iran into a very dangerous geopolitical uh, situation. Um, if you remember as well, at the beginning of the year, uh, we had serious wildfires in Australia, uh, characterizing the climate emergency. Uh, there had been significant protests in Hong Kong and in Lebanon, and of course, in Iran itself. 
looking further forward into the year, uh, we were expecting, and we still are, of course, US presidential elections. Brexit remains unresolved in terms of the UK's um, relationship with the European Union. So all of that was creating large degrees of uncertainty, uh, and uncertainty is never good for uh, global growth. Then as if that wasn't enough, all of this that you see on your screen, as if that wasn't enough, along comes COVID-19 and shuts down China at the very beginning of its new year, the usually auspicious year of the rat. So the big question, the question that everybody still to this day is asking is how bad will it get? Um, we see data changing every day and I'll share with you some scenarios that we've modelled uh, where we think this is likely to go. But needless to say, this has jumped right to the top of uh, our risk matrix. Uh, very high risk, very high impact. So the virus does now look set to spread unabated across the globe throughout the first half of 2020. I don't think there is a corner of the world that it hasn't now touched. Um, and it seems that there is very little chance uh, that a vaccine will be developed before the middle of 2021 at the earliest, although I'm sure that uh, fantastic scientific and medical minds are, are dedicating themselves to that task now, uh, so we could get lucky. Um, but the World Health Organization has warned that the coronavirus pandemic is still accelerating, and there are, of course, now more than 600,000 cases confirmed. Um, I don't know where you're looking for your data. There are some fantastic uh, resources out there. Uh, I've been looking at a site called worldometers.info and they update their figures every day um, as, as each country reports its new cases and its new fatalities. Um, but growth is exponential, growth of, of, of both the number of cases and growth of the deaths as, as represented by those sharply rising graphs on the right there. So just to give you a sense of what's been happening in terms of the number of cases uh, developing here, it took 67 days from the first reported case of COVID-19 to reach 100,000 cases, 67 days for that first 100,000 to be reached. Then it was 11 days for the second 100,000, it was four days for the third 100,000, three for the next, two for the next, and the last 100,000 was reached in just 1.5 days. So you can see how quickly uh, the situation uh, is accelerating. Um, as of now, it's the USA, Italy, China, Spain, and Germany that occupy the top five places in terms of overall cases. But there are a number of other things that I think it's worth paying attention to. On a positive note, I think it's worth paying attention to recoveries and total cases uh, minus recoveries. Uh, and minus deaths is the active number of cases. And, and of course, what's interesting to see there is that China, um, you know, 81,500 total cases, 75,500 of those recovered. Um, and that means that China, in terms of active cases, unbelievably, is now outside of the top 20. Um, so, uh, so that's a significant change to a situation, of course, China, where COVID-19 originated, uh, has really made every effort to get on top of uh, the spread of the virus. We'll look at that a little bit uh, later. Um, but I think it's worth saying that the number of cases is proving to be a very unreliable measure and indicator of the spread of the virus because testing um, is not happening regularly and uniformly across the world. Um, Germany, for example, you can see there that Germany has reported nearly 60,000 cases, but only 433 deaths. Compare that with Spain, uh, has 73,000 cases, uh, a little more, but nearly a 20-fold increase in the number of deaths compared to Germany. Now, uh, while Germany has an enviable health system, it has a lot of ventilators, it has a lot of intensive care beds, um, that alone can't explain the discrepancy there. So the main conclusion I think one has to draw from that is that Germany is probably on top of its testing more so than most other countries on that list. Uh, and so I suspect what we're seeing here is a significant level of underreporting of the total number of cases 
in those countries with a much higher death rate. And that could be by a significant factor of 10 or 20 fold or even more. Um, as I said, deaths are probably an easier measure, sadly. Uh, and in that case, uh, it's Italy, Spain, China and Iran that sadly lead, uh, lead this league table. Uh, but also look across to the right there and you can have a look at the stat there, which, which is deaths per million of population. Um, and that shows the problem relative to the population size. And then we're looking at places like Italy, Spain, France, Switzerland, Spain and the Netherlands uh, as, uh, as having the highest death rate in terms of the size of their population. Um, but as I say, that variation in mortality rate suggests there's a significant underdiagnosis. And I'm sure we all know family and friends around the world who, who perhaps suspect they have or have had COVID-19 but haven't. Uh, been tested or haven't been able to be tested. Um, now I've, I've put there the top 10 but obviously below that you can see I've added uh, a number of countries from closer to home here in the Middle East uh, and you can see the countries of the region uh, which have the highest number of reported cases um, and I think what we're really looking out for uh, here in terms of risk is the rapid spread of the disease to countries with weaker health systems than those at the top of the table. Um, and the spread of the disease to places in, for example, sub-Saharan Africa uh, would really further accelerate the spread of the virus and, uh, and ramp up global uncertainty even further. Even in developed countries, healthcare systems are struggling to cope with the high number of patients requiring intensive care. You can only imagine uh, what it would be like uh, in, in places less well equipped to handle that. Now I mentioned that China is no longer the main location of new infections. Uh, indeed the vast majority of new diagnoses are, are being made outside of China, almost all now. So I think that gives us some hope and I think that also provides the world with some lessons. Um, now here you can see uh, the number of COVID-19 cases confirmed in China but outside the Hubei province. Um, and you can see there that the peak of virus viral infections uh, happened about two weeks after the uh, the lockdown uh, was initiated. Uh, and I think for those uh, countries now that are that are imposing lockdowns, uh, hopefully they will be able to see the rate of infection slowing and then falling uh, as those lockdowns and social distancing measures take effect. Now, I think there's a serious question about whether less authoritarian states can replicate the success that China achieved. Um, perhaps it's harder to imagine uh, in, in some European countries, for example, the same measures being put into place and citizens accepting those. Uh, but nevertheless, here is, here is a, a positive model and one that I think uh, will give hope to authorities following China's path. Now, China is slowly going back to work. Uh, we track a lot of proxy measures to, to see uh, what kind of economic activity there is uh, in China. So we look at things like power consumption, uh, carbon uh, emissions, product inventory and prices. Traffic congestion is the one that you see there on the screen. And you can see that uh, there was that Chinese New Year when really um, things were slow in China anyway. Uh, but then obviously uh, COVID-19 really hit home and economic activity really didn't come back as it had done in previous years. Uh, but there you are, after the lockdown, after 30 days or so after that, uh, um, after that, that time uh, when COVID was really identified, uh, you can see that slowly China started to go back to work, congestion index is, is rising, and here we are now with congestion almost at uh, a level that you all might have expected uh, in previous years. Um, now, other countries are obviously at a much earlier stage of their epidemic cycle, and it's those in those countries uh, where a difficult choice uh, is, is being made by governments, and that is whether to let the epidemic run its natural course and peak quickly, or to spread over a longer period of time with those social distancing, isolation, quarantine, even lockdown measures. And the trade-off really is, is one uh, between health outcomes and economic damage. Uh, and so the graph there you see on the left is one that I'm sure you've seen 
a number of times there before, and this is all about what they call pushing down the peak of the infection uh, with those isolation measures. If you don't do it, um, the virus uh, is is quite rampant, is quite quick, and it hits a large number of the, a large proportion of the population quite quickly. And the risk there is that it goes way above the country's healthcare capacity. If that happens, then the vulnerable members of those society are highly at risk. And you can see at the, the chart over there on the right hand side of the screen that um, it's about a 10% mortality rate for people over 70 years old. Um, so uh, I think most governments have probably rightly decided that they ought to uh, try to do something to reduce that peak, to take it down to a level where their healthcare industry can cope. Um, and that should, uh, that should minimize uh, the number of serious cases and fatalities. I think it would be a very brave or perhaps unwise politician who said, well, let's try and minimize economic damage rather than uh, minimize fatalities. I think that's, uh, that's a very difficult argument to make. Um, so most countries now are pursuing uh, these lockdown measures to different degrees, depending on where they are in the cycle. Um, and, uh, and protecting their more vulnerable measures of, in society. Now, it's worth remembering, of course, that it's not the virus itself that causes the economic damage, but the government policy response. Um, people being at home, not at work, businesses being shut. We've seen that, of course, a lot in hospitality, entertainment, restaurants, um, borders closed. Um, and these are the things that are causing business damage. So if you look at uh, this measure, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, of PMI, Purchasing Managers Index, uh, and this basically shows levels of activity, levels of B2B activity within, uh, within the relevant economies. Uh, anything above that 50 line um, shows expansion of activity, anything below that 50 line shows contraction. Of, of activity and, and what you can see there right at the end of that graph is that um, COVID-19 and the measures that have been taken to try to mitigate its worst effects have had an extraordinary effect on, on the PMI. Um, steeper and deeper than we've seen or than we saw uh, during the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Um, so uh, so that, I think, puts it into some kind of context. There you see the US, you see the UK, you see the Euro area, but I suspect this will be replicated in other parts of the world as well. Um, there are questions about um, how the world will bounce back from this, as undoubtedly it will at some stage, either when um, we're on top of the spread of this virus or indeed when a, um, a vaccine really starts the fight back. Um, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether um, do, whether a recession caused by a pandemic uh, enjoys a very sharp recovery uh, because plainly demand uh, that is lost in the period of the pandemic comes back strongly afterwards. People who haven't been going out, people who haven't been spending money, people who have been delaying purchases, delaying holidays, um, will ultimately, when the coast is clear, release that spending. Uh, and I think there's some fairness in that comment, um, although some, some aspects of that spending will be lost for good, um, especially, especially in the services sector. Um, you, you, know, you might have not been to a restaurant for two months by the time this comes to uh, an end, but I don't think you're going to make up all of those lost restaurant opportunities. You might not have gone on holiday in that period, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take another extra holiday uh, before the year is out. Some will. Uh, but I don't suppose that all of that economic activity will be recovered. So we'll have to see um, the shape and the extent of the recovery, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. So what can and are governments doing to protect their economies? Well, the two levers that governments usually use for these sorts of things are monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus. Um, we've seen monetary stimulus in some places in the world that, that, ha that have been able to do that. Uh, for those that have had room um, on their uh, on their base rates. So, for example, the US announced 250 uh, basis point emergency interest rate cuts in quick succession. The UK uh, has taken its own interest rates uh, down to a record low. But 
But there are other institutions like the Bank of Japan, like the European Central Bank, that are very constrained in their response to the coronavirus outbreak in terms of monetary stimulus, because their headline rates are already around zero. So their only realistic course of action uh, would be to ease lending conditions for banks and quantitative easing and things like that. So the main thing that we're seeing from governments around the world is uh, fiscal stimulus, spending. Um, now, there, are, there have been billions and trillions um, already promised to various economies around the world to support uh, businesses that are losing trade, to support employees that risk losing their jobs, uh, including the self-employed as well. There are some being some very creative work done uh, by governments around the world to try to ensure that, uh, that people are not getting themselves into financial trouble as a result of this. Um, but even this is difficult because many countries already have very high levels of debt. I mean, in Japan, you've got public debt already at around 230% of GDP, uh, the highest ratio in the world. So very hard to imagine that it can go much higher without becoming a systemic threat to the global economy. Um, and of course, in other highly indebted developing countries, uh, especially those where that debt is denominated in the US dollar, which has strengthened somewhat over the recent weeks, uh, fiscal stimulus would really raise the risk of a debt crisis a bit further down the road. Um, now, a lot of what's being done has been done in an effort to boost confidence because sentiment plays an important part in all of this. Now, on Monday, the 9th of March, uh, nearly three weeks ago now, uh, you'll remember the stock markets fell very sharply on that day. Um, they've recovered slightly, as you can see on this graph, but still we're getting changes of huge magnitude on a daily basis, changes that uh, you wouldn't normally see in trading. Um, and I think that leads to a fair question, which is whether the markets have and are overreacting to COVID-19. Um, and perhaps they are, but I think really stock markets are just operating uh, at the same level of uncertainty as the rest of us, particularly how deep and how deep is this going to be and how long is it going to last. Um, so that's what's happening at the moment. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there is uh, a lot of disruption um, and, uh, and the markets are bouncing around. Uh, of course, looking for signals, looking for clues, as they always do, as to what might happen. So uh, reacting and probably overreacting to, uh, to, to announcements that are coming out from various governments around the world. Um, as well as stock markets, um, many commodities were affected, and in particular, the price of oil collapsed on that same day from around $59 at the beginning of that day to around 33 at the end of that day. Um, today, it's around $28 for a, barrel of Brent, uh, for a barrel of Brent crude. And the oil market in particular was hit by fears that global oil consumption could contract in 2020 if the virus wasn't contained rapidly and, and continues to weigh on economic activity. Uh, and I think that's probably, that was probably a fair concern if you think that the vast majority of demand or vast majority of new demand for oil uh, comes out of Asia, 30% of that from China, 50% in total from Asia, uh, of course, when that was the, 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 the main center of the coronavirus outbreak, uh, there were grave concerns that that would lead to um, a massive drop in demand for oil. Um, but it wasn't all about supply and demand in the oil market. Um, it was also uh, caused by a surprise price war that was initiated by Saudi Arabia and sparked by the failure of the OPEC plus agreement. Um, Saudi essentially failed to persuade Russia to cut production levels in response to slowing demand. Um, Saudi decided in retaliation in response to that to simply pump as much oil as it possibly could and to sell it at a discount, particularly to Russia's oil customers. Uh, the US, as demonstrated by this fabulous cover of The Spectator, was caught in the middle. Now, what was Saudi doing there? This, uh, this seems to be counterintuitive for, for somewhere like Saudi that relies so much on, on oil revenues. Well, Saudi has relatively low production costs, it has deep pockets, and I think it needed to show that it could flex its muscles here in this situation when it didn't get its way. Um, 
So Saudi here is demonstrating its power as a major oil producer, but nevertheless, um, a low oil price environment would be, will be particularly harmful, particularly to our region here in the Middle East. There will, of course, be some beneficiaries and, uh, and, and countries that are high net importers of oil will benefit from this low price environment. But here in the Middle East, uh, the price war will make a real mess of public finances. So here are a couple of graphs that, that demonstrate that. Um, over there on the left, you can see um, what we think will happen when Saudi ramps up its production towards its uh, daily capacity of, of, of 12 million barrels per day. Um, you'll see that over the last few years, America surprisingly has, has become almost quietly become the world's largest oil producer. Um, but its shale oil business uh, is very price sensitive and it, it simply can't sustain a profit at the kind of levels uh, that we're seeing oil at the moment. Uh, Russia, uh, well, Russia's going to be a, an interesting uh, negotiator uh, on, on this. If you look at the graph on the right-hand side there, um, you can see something that makes me think that perhaps Russia isn't quite as concerned with a low price environment as, uh, as you might imagine. So what we have here is the fiscal break-even price for oil for each of the major producers. Now, this isn't the cost of getting oil out of the ground. This isn't the production cost. This is the fiscal break-even price. So this is the price that each country needs to achieve to, to get to budget break-even. Now, oil producers in this region remain heavily dependent on oil earnings. Um, it makes up a large part of government revenue. So Saudi there needs to achieve an oil price about $83 a barrel to, to break even on its budget. And that's because Saudi has a very undiversified economy, very oil, heavily oil dependent. It has um, a very large public sector, which is expensive. Uh, it has large citizen subsidies, no income tax, for example, uh, free health care, free schooling for Saudi citizens. Uh, so it spends a lot of that money that comes out of the ground in the form of oil on its citizens. And of course, it also funds some very, very big investment plans at the moment. If you've read Saudi's 2030 vision, uh, you'll know that they have huge ambitions to develop their economy. And of course, they have these big mega projects as well, which have been widely publicized, and these all need paying for. And that's why Saudi has such a high fiscal break-even price. Um, others uh, have uh, similarly high break-even prices. The UAE, there you can see it, around $70 a barrel. And then that number falls as you run down the list there. Qatar doesn't need quite as much. Uh, and Russia there at the bottom, only about $42 a barrel to achieve fiscal break-even. Now, of course, you can still prefer to have a higher oil price, but Russia is quite content at the moment to squeeze the US as well. So this is kind of a, a three-way fight uh, rather than simply a two-way price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia. And that means that the solution here is probably that not, not very simple. Um, so at a time when um, governments in the Middle East will be increasing their spending to cope with the economic effects of the coronavirus, they are going to register significant fiscal deficits. And while the richer oil producing states have substantial sovereign wealth funds that they can dip into to see them through a temporary oil market shock, um, the question is for how long? So Saudi, for example, budgeted for a $50 billion deficit in 2020, and that looks certain now to surpass $100 billion. But the kingdom has about $500 billion in the central bank, and it can borrow cheaply. The UAE, the United Arab Emirates, has an expansionary budget that's been meant to kickstart what has been uh, quite a weak economy, and some of this will probably have to be scaled back. Um, we do, of course, face the question of what might happen with Expo, and I believe the steering committee is meeting tomorrow, uh, and, and they could be about to announce a delay of a year to Expo. We've seen something similar, of course, um, with the Olympics in Tokyo. Um, the other problem, of course, that the UAE has is that it does have an alternative to oil, uh, and it's been, been very successful in building up uh, another industry. But sadly for the UAE, that industry is tourism, uh, and that has provided around 12% of GDP. But COVID-19 has decimated visitor numbers in the UAE and around the world, of course, right in the middle of probably the busiest holiday season here leading up to spring break. So, so that's, uh, that's been a bit of a double whammy 
for the UAE. Uh, consider some other smaller countries in the region as well. Oman, for example, uh, its 2020 budget predicted a, a deficit of 8% of GDP uh, with oil around $60 a barrel, but prices at or around 30 will send the deficit higher than 25%. Bahrain, a middling producer that nonetheless relies on oil for about 75% of public revenue, had hoped to balance its budget by 2022, but its debt load will now jump over 100% of GDP. Iran, already under huge pressure uh, from sanctions uh, from America, with Syria and China its only export markets for oil, uh, and a low oil price environment is really not going to help Iran. Uh, and we've seen, or well, we did see um, not so long ago, quite significant social unrest in Iran. Uh, and I suspect that uh, once people are allowed back outside again, uh, that social unrest could easily uh, ignite again. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, places like Nigeria and Angola, also quite oil dependent economies. Um, so they will also be suffering. Um, so what do we think is going to happen to oil prices? Well, these are our new forecasts represented there by the light blue line on the graph. Um, we now have uh, oil averaging just $32.1 a barrel through the course of 2020, and that's been marked down even over the course of the last week. Uh, we think that that will recover slightly to around 36.3 barrels in 2021 and it won't be until 2022 and beyond that we think oil will return to the range bound situation in which we recently left it where it sits somewhere between 60 and 70 dollars a barrel because of the impact of the us uh, which really acts as a swing producer now because of those shale oil um those, those shale oil or production facilities which which really come on stream um, around mid $60 a barrel and, and they flood the market, that puts downward pressure, they turn off, and that puts upward pressure and so on. So you get this wave effect on oil prices, but that's what we were used to last year, uh, but plainly COVID-19 and the price war has, has really impacted oil prices in a way that supply and demand simply couldn't. Um, oil price forecasting, very, very, sorry, is there a question coming in? Um, yes, so there are a couple of questions. I'm wondering if you would be able to answer these or do you want to proceed and then take them at the end? Uh, yeah, if you think they're relevant, if you think that would uh, help with the clarification of what I'm talking about, do, um, do please um, pitch in. Yeah. So there's one related to uh, the oil production. It's, the question is, where are all this production of oil? Where is it all consumed and how much can be stocked in tanks? Yeah, so storage is going to be significant here because, you know, plainly if you've got oil demand uh, weak or even potentially falling, but oil production uh, at, um, you know, at record highs, then that oil has to go somewhere. Um, you've got Saudi Arabia furiously pumping oil. You've got Russia refusing to reduce its, um, its oil production. Um, so perhaps the, the one that's being squeezed at the moment is the US and certainly those big shale oil facilities uh, will be turned off uh, for the time being. We may even see um, some business failures there. Um, so if the US production falls, that will obviously um, be taken up by the additional production out of Saudi. Um, but otherwise, it's going into storage and I think you're going to see a lot of ships uh, at sea with full tanks, and you're going to see a lot of uh, onshore storage facilities as well sat there with large amounts of oil. And of course, that means that we're going to have oversupply for some time. So this problem isn't going to go away short uh, anytime soon. Um, so it'll take a long while for that oil to work through the system. Um, so yeah, that's that's why we think that the low oil price environment will last, even if. Russia and Saudi do get around the negotiating table sooner rather than later. Yeah. So can we take another question uh, before we move on? Uh, we have sure. a question from Tarek asking, what is the aftermath impact of COVID-19 on the banking sector in the MENA region, especially on the non-oil producer countries? And do you expect other countries to follow the same fate of Lebanon? Well, I think that's a that's a very interesting question. So, you know, are we likely to see problems um, with the banks? Are we likely to see runs on banks? Are we, you know, and again, this is this is very much a sentiment and confidence question. 
Um, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, we haven't seen people trying to get money out of their banks in large numbers. We haven't seen a banking crisis yet. But you know, plainly, um, as this works through, we're going to start to see um, what this means in terms of the banking sector. So you know, follow this through logically. At the moment, you're seeing businesses um, asking for uh, holidays in terms of, of, of payments, in terms of rent uh, on, on their premises. Um, you're probably seeing payment delays um, from, from company to company. Uh, and of course, all this is going to put a huge strain on financial systems. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got much higher sovereign risk uh, coming out as, as countries deploy these massive fiscal stimulus plans. Um, and of course, while some of this money is going to be printed, uh, you know, with the risk of some inflationary effect, um, there are, of course, are also going to be huge strains put on the, uh, on the financial services sector. So I think that's definitely one to keep an eye on. It's not something that's being talked about um, seriously at the moment, but plainly as this all washes through and as we start to see potentially business failures, um, then we're starting to see some, some increased bad debts. And then I think that's what's going to put pressure on the, uh, on the banks. Um, so, so no immediate sign of that yet, but but surely um, we are going to see some business failures. We are therefore going to see um, some some debt problems, uh, and, and that's what presumably the banks are, are, are worried about at the moment. You've also got, of course, governments telling the banks to loosen lending conditions, which in itself increases the risk to the banking sector. So, um, yeah, I think it's a good question. Uh, it's one that we're certainly considering, but we haven't seen any evidence that anyone else is following. Uh, the problems in Lebanon just yet. Number of questions coming through. I'm wondering sure, if you want to take them. Okay, Let's, so let me let me. I'll, I'll try and speed up a little bit because if we can get to the sure. end and go through a few yeah. questions, hopefully what 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 follows here might answer a few of the questions that are coming through. Um, okay, that. So I wanted to share with you um, some scenarios that. Uh, that we've been planning. But as I, as I mentioned, forecasting is particularly difficult at the moment. Um, you know, our forecasts are usually created on a monthly basis, but, uh, but now we're, um, you know, we're certainly at a weekly frequency now and some of our forecasts are changing almost daily. So you can see that this scenario um, grid here was created on the 6th of March and it is now hugely out of date. So um, I just wanted to, 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 to show you what's happening with this. So um, the optimistic scenario was gone almost as soon as we wrote it. Um, and back on March the 6th, we were talking about a baseline scenario where the global economy slowed to around 1.9% growth, but recession was avoided. Well, that's also out now. Um, so we've now moved into the pessimistic scenario where person-to-person -person transmission of COVID-19 is widespread. And we are talking about a potential end game of somewhere between 20 to 50 percent of the global population being infected. Now, I think that is worth challenging because, you know, we looked at those China numbers and we've seen that, that they peaked and that they're falling. Um, so you might be asking, well, why are we talking about 20 percent plus of the population um, at risk of infection? Well, I think there are a few points to make there. Firstly, um, so far, these infections have largely been in the countries best equipped to deal with it. You saw China mobilise in an extraordinary way its response to COVID-19. But as I mentioned, if, if this really takes hold in subcontinent, in sub-Saharan Africa, then we're going, to, we're going to see much faster and deeper um, penetration of the population. Uh, so I think there is still a grave risk that uh, this will go much farther, uh, faster than we've seen. There is, of course, also the risk of secondary um, infections. So you're not out of the woods with this uh, until really a vaccine has been created and, and has been deployed. And, and whilst any small number of cases remain in the population, there will be a risk of, um, of, of further infections. Of course, as more and more people have had it, uh, this, this thing that you've heard called herd immunity takes effect and that slows the, the spread of the virus. But the pessimistic scenario is, is nevertheless that uh, large swathes of the population are likely to be infected. Um, you're likely therefore to see large um, requirements for quarantine and lockdown as we're seeing in, in most of the countries so far affected and healthcare systems severely strained. Um, 
There is, of course, a risk that the virus becomes a seasonal disease. Um, so until that vaccine is produced and until it can be widely distributed, there's a chance that, uh, that it comes back every now and again. And we don't really yet know whether this virus is weather dependent. Um, there, has, there have been rumours that the virus doesn't do well in temperatures above 26, 27 degrees, uh, which would be good news for us here in the Middle East as we approach the summer, uh, but I think that is still really as yet an unknown. Um, the nightmare scenario is not pleasant, and it's probably not worth exploring at this stage, other than to say that that, that comes with a serious risk of the collapse of governments of those countries that doesn't cope, um, leading to some quite severe refugee problems. Um, and, and if that really starts to happen, then the global economy isn't going to recover uh, until probably the middle of 2022. Um, so um, we're not there yet. We're somewhere between that baseline and that pessimistic scenario. Uh, but nevertheless, we have had to we've had to downgrade our forecasts quite frequently. So it's a fast moving picture. Um, but these are the forecasts that we produced um, on uh, Thursday, Friday, so they're reasonably hot off the press, and they are a significant downgrade to the scenarios that we released just 10 days before. So that's how quickly we have changed our forecasts um, from what was 1% global growth to now minus 2.2% global growth. So we've had to revise our forecast for GDP growth, for inflation, for trade, and for commodity prices. Um, so we believe that global output will contract by 2.2% this year. And bear in mind that as recently as December, we were still talking about full year growth of plus 2.3% before the outbreak really took hold. Um, there are some low lights on that graph there. You can see, I mean, the Eurozone, um, those countries within the EU that operate the Euro as their currency will register a full year recession in 2020 of nearly 6%. Um, and of course, that's that's because those economies are led by some of the countries that are really suffering at the moment, like France, Italy, Spain, Germany. Um, so, so the eurozone is really um, where this is being felt most keenly at the moment. At the moment, um, we think trade disruptions uh, will be very severe, and we'll see global trade contracting by 1.4 percent in 2020. Although, interestingly, inflation. Um, we, we think that the demand dampening impact of the coronavirus will largely balance the supply shock. So no huge impact globally. We've ticked it up to 3.8% this year. Um, but of course, this is a blend uh, of, of all of the global inflationary uh, figures. And, and you might see some, some regional pressures on inflation and also some potential currency crises. Um, Here's our forecast, a bit more granularity, a bit more detail here for the G20 economies. And what you can see here is that we expect all the G7 countries and all but three of the G20 companies to experience a full year recession in 2020 now. The three countries that will avoid recession, according to our latest forecasts, are India, Indonesia, and ironically, China itself. Um, so we expect China's real, real GDP growth to drop to 1% this year, and that was down from 5.9% before the coronavirus outbreak started. So the countries that are, are we're expecting to avoid recession are largely only doing so because they were, they were forecast to have much higher growth rates uh, in any case. Um, we think that the US's output will contract by 2.8% this year, and that's down from a full year growth of 1.7% we forecast before the coronavirus outbreak started. Um, that has big questions and big implications, I guess, for the US election coming later this year. Um, I think there's every chance that if Trump doesn't uh, really mess this up, if his, if his response to the coronavirus is seen as OK, uh, that might strengthen him because people automatically look to their leaders in times of crisis. And they don't necessarily want change. But nevertheless, this is uh, especially this damages the US economy in the way that we're forecasting. Uh, I think that makes his re-election much less certain than perhaps it was uh, before this started. I think the other thing to say is although these are full year forecasts for 2020, they mask some quite substantial quarter on quarter variations. Um, so again, for most of these territories, um, the, the deepest uh, part of the contraction is happening in 
Q1 and Q2, and we're expecting some level of recovery in the second half of the year, although the risk of that is very much still on the downside. Um, in terms of the global map, that's what, what we're looking like for the regions. Um, and I mentioned earlier the challenge for emerging markets, and, and particularly if the, if the virus takes hold in those markets, uh, I think then the challenge will be, um, will be harder uh, than, than even these figures portray. Um, so in sub-Saharan Africa there, you can see a forecast of minus 0.2%, which doesn't look terrible, but of course, you know, emerging markets should be growing fast. They've got catching up to do. Uh, they've got some relatively easy wins. And so you would normally expect to see fast growth rates in emerging markets. And what you're seeing here is a contraction. Um, you know, in countries running a current account deficit there, uh, their currencies will come under pressure. So the continent's largest economy, Nigeria, we saw an effective 15% currency devaluation at the back end of last week. So we can expect inflation there to soar and economic growth to slow. Uh, we can't rule out a recession there. Uh, South Africa, I think, is really the one to watch out for. Um, the continent's second largest economy. You know, South Africa finished 2019 in recession uh, and grappled with the real difficulties like chronic power shortages. And, and, and the government there has very little scope for, for any counter cyclical uh, stimulus um, in the face of a, of a global economic downturn. Um, in terms of what's happening with the virus in South Africa, so it was March the 18th, South Africa had reported 116 cases. We're now 11 days later and it's reported 10 times as many. So quite serious growth of the virus there in South Africa. And again, I reiterate, this is only tested cases. So many, many more could be out there um, in, in South African communities. And of course, this is hugely worrying in a country with the world's highest levels of infection of, of HIV and AIDS, which is um, a disease which suppresses the immune system. Uh, South Africa also has 30% unemployment. So you've got a real cocktail there for, for, for disaster, especially if families lose their breadwinner. Uh, you've got a country there where the state really can't afford to help. Uh, moving north into the Middle East, you know, we've got a real mix here of, of some of the world's richest and poorest nations, uh, but also some of the world's riskiest states and most vulnerable sovereigns. Um, you know, a combination there of heightened geopolitical risk and over-reliance on volatile oil earnings, as we've already, as we've already discussed. Now, while some of the wealthier Gulf Arab states have good public health systems, other countries in the region just lack the infrastructure and financial wherewithal to deal with an extensive coronavirus outbreak. So places like Iran, obviously already under severe strain from US sanctions, but also places like Egypt, you know, they will feel the strain very heavily. Um, and then, of course, if the epidemic spreads to conflict zones in the region, such as Syria, uh, Yemen, Libya, uh, it will be it will just be impossible to contain. So. You know, that I think speaks to, to some of the more negative views about the potential spread of this virus. Uh, I mentioned also, you know, regional tourist destinations uh, such as the UAE, but also Oman and Egypt, they'll be severely affected. And you know, the UAE also by its status as a shipping hub. Um, just wanted to, to say, you know, we talk a lot about GDP at The Economist. Um, you know, it's a nice round measure that I think sums everything up and packages it into a single figure. Uh, it's useful for businesses and, and useful for politicians to look at and, and say whether countries and regions are doing well. Um, but you know, perhaps at the moment, a dashboard of indicators that we better use right now is more the dashboard of indicators around health outcomes, around the risk of business failures, unemployment and income losses for, for workers particularly low-income workers. And, 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 and so, you know, I think we're trying to focus more on the human aspect of this than simply this, uh, this GDP overview. Uh, and it was for that reason that we conducted a survey of, of uh, Economist Corporate Network members and other business leaders here uh, in the region. And I'll just take you very quickly through these before I come to an end. There's just a few more slides left. Um, but we were asking, first of all, about the impact on business uh, and how the outbreak has affected people's growth expectations for the year as a whole. Here you can see that uh, for more than 8 in 10 companies, uh, their expectations are of downgrades. Some of those have already happened. Some of those are likely. 
Uh, I suspect if we ask that question again this week, um, that uh, the, those companies that have downgraded their outlook will, will, be, will be more than those that are expecting to, because I think this is already happening. Um, um, the questions about um, how long people anticipate business disruption to last. I think this, this is really the this is really the critical question that nobody is able to answer. I think that's reflected here by a very wide range of answers here. You've got some pessimists who think uh, that this will last more than six months. The, the largest group there, the, the, the most common reply was four to six months. And I guess that probably is reflective of, of, of where we are at the moment. Uh, and people thinking that um, these lockdown measures will, will take at least a month or two to start having an impact, to start seeing the graph turn, but business impact is likely to last for a little while longer than that. Uh, a few optimists there thinking that uh, disruption will last less than three months. Um, the less, uh, the, the sort of the, the nasty surprises uh, are, are in this chart here, I think. And whilst you might expect people to be deferring investment projects at the moment, which is the most common answer, if you look further down that, uh, that graph, you'll see there, 24% of organisations that we surveyed uh, have had to make redundancies among their workforce. Uh, and again, we can expect that to increase uh, the longer this goes on. Uh, companies also requiring staff to take unpaid leave, uh, 20%. And again, uh, perhaps that will increase um, as the pressure builds on businesses. So, you know, you've really got some, some personal problems emerging, and particularly in places like the UAE where employment in, and residency are, are linked, um, you know, we, we might consider what that might mean after this crisis is over in terms of the overall population of places like the UAE, uh, and you might see something of an expat exodus, much like we saw in that 2008-2009 financial crisis. Um, business leaders, you know, they're people too, don't forget, and, um, you know, they, they, they have their own concerns. Um, what I would say here is that you know, their own concerns about personal health are dwarfed by their concerns about their family's health and the health of their employees. Um, you know, there was, ex there was concern expressed here about their family's financial security, but you know, given that we're talking about business leaders here, presumably some of the better paid members of society, you can only imagine how much more uh, concern will be expressed among people with lower incomes. Um, the three bars on the right there just simply show that, uh, as is usually the case with surveys, uh, people's concern increases as you move from micro to macro. Yeah, you know, my business, well, you know, I'm concerned about it, but I'm much more concerned about the region, and I'm even more concerned about the world. And I guess that's because those things lie outside of people's control. Um, but I think, you know, this is really just to sort of try and understand the more human aspects of this challenge. Um, and I think people are starting to give some consideration as to what life and business is likely to be like when this all finally does come to an end. Um, and, I, and I just leave this, um, this sort of summary chart here of, of what we're likely to expect. Uh, this hopefully sort of sums up everything I've just described. But I think you know there are some more philosophical discussions to be had here. You know, what kind of society are we likely to emerge blinking into when this is all over? You know, are we is public appetite for, for for higher taxing and spending likely to to increase? You know, are we likely to see those key workers that we're all applauding from our balconies and our streets at eight o'clock every night? You know, are we genuinely going to invest more in their salaries and equip them better to to do the the, the crucial jobs that they do for us? Um, are we are we more comfortable now with a rollback of our civil liberties? You know, we're we're living through this now. We're, we've never you know, we're, most of us have never experienced lockdowns before. We're, we're experiencing them now. Uh, but what happens when this is over? Are we are we happy with more authoritarian regimes? Are we happy with big state, uh, big government, um, nationalism? Um, so, and, and, and are we in, as interested uh, in, in growth? Are we as fixated on GDP as we were before? So I think these are all good questions to ask, and hopefully these will be the subjects of many dissertations to come. Um, in terms of the recovery, um, you know, you know, will it be a V-shaped recovery? Unlikely. I think it's more likely to be U-shaped because I think this will have a relatively um, extended bottom. Uh, we might even see W-shaped recoveries, especially if there are 
uh, reoccurrences of, of viruses, uh, virus outbreaks. Um, so um, I'm going to leave it there. I've, I've, I've left you with some questions, but I think there are lots of questions um, in the system there. So we've probably got about 10 minutes or so, depending on whether the guys are happy to, to run over. Um, but uh, Hima, I don't know if you've got uh, any any questions there you want to select uh, yeah. and, and pose. Actually, we have a lot. I don't know which one to select. So um, let's see. So we have a question from Jad. He's asking, how would business leaders react to the decline in revenues with a high uncertainty in the market? Would governments increase their investments or public-private partnerships in order to faster the market recovery? Yeah, I mean, you know, the normal response from business leaders to declining revenues is to cut costs. And the uh, and the quickest uh, and most effective way usually to cut costs is to cut staff. Um, but I think governments around the world are urging caution, urging patience among business leaders at the moment because what they really don't want to see at the, uh, when this all uh, when this all comes to an end is uh, is is hugely inflated unemployment figures. I mean, I think you know we were all a bit shocked. I think to see the U.S. last week, where I think if, if memory serves me right, you know, unemployment claimants went from 300,000 to 3 million in one week, um, and and that that was simply, I'm sure, a function of business leaders shedding staff um, in the light of, of, of much reduced um, revenues. I mean, if you think about the hospitality businesses that are all shut down at the moment, you know, they're having to keep staff on their books um, uh, without any meaningful revenues. And, you know, they will have landlords and suppliers breathing down their necks. They'll have the tax man breathing down their necks. And, and even if the government starts to give people a break on taxes or even if landlords start to say, well, you know, I'll give you a three month holiday. You know, those landlords have still got to earn to, to maintain their own workforces and their own costs. So, you know, this simply gets passed down the line. So I, I think, you know, business leaders at the moment will really be struggling with this. Um, you know, those with good cash positions perhaps will will have a bit more breathing space. Um, but, you know, we know that the airlines, for example, are, uh, you know, uh, in different uh, stages of panic with, with this situation and they'll be asking the government for help. Um, and you know the businesses, the types of businesses that are affected and, and, and they will be uh, and their employees will be deeply concerned about the risk of, of redundancy at this time. Um, so yeah, I think that would be the normal that would be the normal expectation for businesses in a, in, a, in something in a in a period in a time like this. Um, but you know, on the positive side, as I've mentioned, you know, if 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 this can be controlled and 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 business activity does come back quickly, then any business that has shed too many staff is not going to be in a position to to take advantage of that. Of that spike in demand, so I think people, I think business leaders will also be looking at that and thinking, well, we don't want to cut too far and too deep. If we can rely on government help and support uh, to maintain our workforce through this period of time, or furlough staff until such time as uh, as, as we're ready to to open up again, uh, then that would be a much better uh, outcome than simply uh, laying people off. Right, so we have another question from Khoram. He's asking, how do you see online e-commerce sector is going to grow? Also, what could be the impact on FMCG business, specifically in the GCC region? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question to ask. I mean, e-commerce uh, is really taking the strain, isn't it, when it comes to um, servicing um, you know, consumers who are really unable to get out and about to the bricks and mortar retail establishments. Uh, we do actually have on the 8th of April, a webinar uh, where we'll be looking at e-commerce and we've got some great speakers from the world of e-commerce talking about how they are gearing up to the challenge of, of increased demand um, from you know, consumers staying at home and, and shopping online. So um, yeah, this is going to grow and I think you know a lot of what we see now will change behaviours longer term. You know, so you know we're not going to see e-commerce do well now and then and then, and then that business all just die away again as, as people uh, return to normal. I think some of that spike will stay. Um, you know, and, and, and frankly, we're going to see that with, I think, some of the tech uh, solutions that we're all using now to stay in touch with friends and colleagues. So, you know, 
there are there are lots of new words in our lexicons now. I don't think um, I don't think I talked much about Zoom um, before this this all broke out, or um, MS Teams, or or Hangouts, or uh, you know, there's there's been a whole load of uh, of, of online connectivity software that we're all now getting used to using. These webinars now, um, you know, really fa fantastic tools for connecting people in a way that we can't at the moment because. Uh, you know, we're limited on our face-to-face -face interactions. So, you know, will businesses see this as an opportunity to reduce their travel bills, to reduce their um, their hotel uh, stays, to reduce their big conferencing costs, uh, to bring their staff together in a way that they've got used to uh, through the sort of the COVID lockdown period. So, um, you know, it's not just e-commerce, but I think there's some of these tools now that will become regular fixtures. Uh, in the communication armory of businesses, and we're going to get much more used to having businesses like this. Um, you know, personally, as someone who runs a, a, a network that, that, that uses a lot of face-to-face -face interactions, you know, I'm really missing that, and, and I'd like to get back to that. Uh, but I have to say that, uh, that the webinars and the other tools that we've been using in the meantime um, have allowed a very fast and frequent means of, of, of connecting and communicating with each other, and I think that will stick. Uh, so I think business business. Uh, behaviors will change as a result. Yes, so we have many questions about unemployment uh, and a lot of concern here. Um, do you think that unemployment rate will peak soon after the virus problem is finished? Well, I think the peak will happen during the outbreak uh, and during the measures that, that, that governments are taking to to, to stop the flow, because it's right now where businesses are carrying the costs of, of large underused uh, workforces. So, you know, if I was a business owner now looking at, um, you know, if I was a consumer facing business owner now, looking at my revenues falling off a cliff, but, uh, but still holding, you know, large um, uh, payroll, uh, then, then of course I have to look at that. Uh, you know, if, if I, if, if, you know, I, I have a responsibility to run my business uh, and, and keep it afloat. And if I'm paying out far too much in, in payroll and I don't have any revenues coming in, then, then I have to look at that. But this is where this fiscal support from governments around the world, I think, is, is really being targeted to try to persuade employers not to do that, um, not to lay people off now uh, and, and, re and regret that later, uh, because the recovery will come. And the recovery will will and should get back to, to pre uh, epidemic levels quite quickly. That's that's normally the feature of a uh, of a pandemic inspired recession. You know, once it's in once it's cleared, people get back to spending. You know, they're they're probably not spent a lot of money during that during that period of time, uh, and and some of that demand will be pent up and will be released. And if you as a business have paired yourself right down to the bare minimum. And then when that when that demand comes flooding back, you're not ready for it. Um, then I think you, you know you're you're going to regret that. So governments, I think, if they can, are, are you know, and we've seen this in, especially in, in in places like the UK, they're they're paying up to 80 percent of uh, of salaries of of, of of employees that are facing um, redundancy uh, in order to persuade businesses not to not to let them go. So. You know, I think while the, the threat of unemployment, the threat of redundancy is something that so many people are worried about right now, and, and rightly so, um, hopefully those targeted government interventions can, can really minimise that. And through this, but Mahdi is asking, do you predict any major shift in the geopolitical landscape in the region due to COVID-19 impact? Um, Again, good question. I said, we, you know, it's almost easy to forget that it was only a few months ago that we were facing, um, you know, really, really um, difficult times in terms of Iran's relationship with the US and the US's allies. Uh, you know, we had missile strikes on 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 Saudi um, oil facilities inside the kingdom. Um, we had the assassination of of, of the Iranian uh, General Soleimani. Um, in Iraq, and we had threats of reprisals, and, and that was really uh, that was really high tension. Um, now, you know, at the moment, I think everyone else has plenty of other stuff to worry about. 
but the US is still ratcheting up pressure on, on, on Iran and, and those sanctions have not been relieved, have not been reduced. And in fact, you've even seen some secondary sanctions imposed on, on countries uh, or companies, sorry, that have uh, been caught uh, dealing with Iran. So, so the, the US has not taken the, the foot off the gas there at all. Um, so you know, will normal service be resumed after all this is over? Uh, I suspect it will. Um, you know that the, the um, you know, and, and I think the machinations at the moment going on with the oil price war uh, will also potentially come back to bite the region. Uh, I think there's unfinished business there as well. So geopolitical tensions uh, for the moment parked to one side. Uh, I don't think we're going to expect anything, any big developments in that space. But uh, that everybody's got a much bigger and more pressing priority at the moment, and that's to fight this uh, this virus. question is about investment. Um, is it a good time to invest? And if yes, uh, in what? Real estate, government, bonds, buying stocks, acquiring small businesses? Which are the business fields to look for? Yeah, well, it depends if you can see the bottom, doesn't it, as always with these things. So, um, you know, the recovery, as I said, could, could come back quite quickly. Um, you know, I think there is a suggestion that the markets have overreacted to this, but nevertheless, if we're talking about a, a major global recession, then the markets will reflect that. Um, you know, you, you saw from the slides I shared earlier that, um, you know, the, the, the stock market indices, um, you know, fell very sharply and there's been something of a recovery um, from those positions. But as I say, you know, the, 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 the virus infection still has a way to go and I think there are still there are still more, there's still more uncertainty there in terms of how how far this could spread, and especially into emerging markets. So, you know, that viral infection rate is still on an acceleration curve in places like the US, in places like Europe. Um, these regions are not uh, are not on top of this yet, and until such time as they are, uh, I think the markets will remain very jittery. Um, now, of course, if you can predict the bottom of the market and if you can see the point of recovery, then, then of course, um, you know, the depths of a recession are a great time to, to, to invest. Um, now, you know, the, the, the things like the property market probably tend to react slower, uh, but undoubtedly there's not much activity going on there at the moment. Uh, and so we might see a bit of a lag there, um, but certainly in terms of stocks and some commodities, yeah, I'm sure that... Uh, I'm sure that smart investors will find the, the exact right moment to jump back in on those. This is traders. Traders make all of their money, of course, on disruption. Um, they can make it up when the markets are going up or down. Um, but uh, for us mere mortals, we've got to get in at the bottom and hopefully ride the curve up. Okay. Um, so, do you then, after the recovery? So, uh, how do you see the rise in the number of businesses being set up in the next couple of days, given the redundancies taking place, especially in FSI? Yeah, I mean, businesses being set up, I, I mean, I can't imagine that now is a particularly fertile time for, for business setup and business establishment. I mean, there, there will be some visionary people who, who see opportunities in all of this. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, those trends towards e-commerce um, and, and digital um, financial services, maybe, you know, maybe this is, this is a perfect time to, to be doing that. Um, but again, I, uh, you know, it would, be a, it would be a brave person who looks at the current environment and thinks now is a, now is a great time to start my business. So do you think that there might be a shift from capitalism into a new system that is a mixture of capitalism and socialism and do you expect the systematic impact caused by this outbreak the the current macro environment yeah. I, th I think there's a real chance that public appetite for bigger government and and, and more nationalization of of important assets um, would be desirable I mean, you know, I think if you um, if you imagine that people are going to live through a few months here, where where governments have really had to come to the aid of of, of people, of um, of businesses, um, you know, if we're getting used to that and if we've supported that, and now you know, are we simply going to return to to normal afterwards? Are we simply going to return to 
to sort of capitalist models um, and say, well, you know, that was a lucky escape. Um, or, or are we actually going to have a much bigger appetite for for higher tax and spend um, after this is all over? I, I don't know if those of you who follow um, British politics, I mean, you know, talking to the University of Manchester here, so presumably lots of you have, have an interest um, in what goes on in the UK. But it was interesting to see Jeremy Corbyn, who uh, who this weekend will step down as leader of the Labour Party, the, uh, the Majesty's opposition. Um, and he produced a video that said, I've been vindicated. You know, here is this died in the wool socialist who um, who's, a, who's a big fan of nationalisation, who's a big fan of, of much bigger government spending, who's a, who's a big fan of wealth redistribution. And he said, you know, it's taken a it's taken a pandemic for for the government to do what I've been advocating for many many years. But see, I've been proved right all along. Um, now, whilst I suspect that that's um, that's probably wishful thinking on his part. I think there's a grain of truth in that. And if we do come out of this, um, you know, thanking our governments for, for these huge fiscal stimuli that they have in, that they've put in place, and, and if they've worked, then I think there will be a much bigger public appetite for, for big government uh, and perhaps something that looks a little bit more socialist uh, in its nature. So perhaps take the last question. I know that there are many questions, but there's a time limit to this. So this question is from Brian, and he's asking, some forecasters are pre predicting oil prices below $10 per barrel due to prolonged demand shortages and uh, the continued aggressive supply. Do you see any scenario for sub $10 oil or any scenario for sub $10 oil? Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly not in our forecast. So our forecast really has the oil price bottoming out at around $20 a barrel. Um, you know, there is potentially downside risk on that, um, but um, but we're not seeing that at the moment. I, I shared our oil price forecast with you. Um, I think there have been some signs that uh, the Russians are closer to returning to the negotiating table uh, and, and re-looking at the OPEC, OPEC plus agreement. Um, but at the moment, I think you've got um, most of the major oil producers who are who are looking who, who are looking much more self-interested. Um, you know, they are. Um, that, that Saudi has essentially decided that it's going to use volume to replace value. You know, if we can't get the price we want, well, let's just shift more of it and sell more of it, and therefore increase our our income that way. But of course, the you know, the value of that of, of that additional production won't make up for the the loss in revenue from the uh, from the lower oil prices, but um, no, we don't see ten dollar oil in our in our forecast. But as I said right at the beginning of this presentation, all of the risk to any of these forecasts at the moment is to the downside, and that I guess is the caveat. Perhaps I should finish. Has asking, uh, what do you think the COVID nineteen impact will be on the private equity, mutual funds, venture capital investing activities? And the capital markets in general in the MENA, MENA region? Yeah, I mean, you know, private equity and capital always always need somewhere to go, uh, and I'm sure that they will be looking quite closely at the, uh, at the businesses that uh, have done or are doing quite well uh, in all of this, but I guess there will also be a significant number of business failures um, from private equity and venture capital through all of this. So, as is always the case, you know, these guys try to balance uh, their, their, their portfolios and try to find a few winners. Uh, this might accelerate some of those. They might find some that really fly, but a number absolutely fail. So um, I think the capital markets in general, um, you know, that's uh, that's proving quite difficult for the time being. And uh, you know, with the with the uh, with the value of equities you know, having fallen so low, um, I, I think people will need to be, you know, will need to be looking at their their portfolios and their earnings uh, and looking for for opportunities elsewhere uh, and normally in these situations you'll see a flight to safe havens a flight to things like gold a flight to dollar which, which obviously is the uh, essentially the reserve uh, currency of the of the world um, so safe havens at the moment is probably where it's at um, but at some stage you know this money needs a home and it will be looking for uh, it'll be looking for where it can go what is the single most dangerous risk for our economy in the UAE? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're living through it at the moment. Um, you know, we, we, we have our, 
uh, risk forecasts for, for every country around the world. Um, and we operate these on a matrix. It's a five by five matrix. So it's a measurement of the likelihood of something happening and then the, uh, the impact of that thing happening. And, and as I said, for most places around the world, the, the highest risk in recent months and years has been the US-China trade war, which has been deepening and which has obviously been causing a lot of trade disruption. Uh, but this COVID-19 virus has overtaken everything. Uh, and the risk to the regional economies here from COVID-19, and I don't want to repeat myself too much, but the risk from that is not only the impact that that might have on the countries of the region, because, you know, plainly, if we get a serious outbreak here, um, you know, that will, that will lengthen uh, the length of time that our economic activity is limited. But that low oil price environment is, you know, is really, is really meaningful for even places like the UAE, which, which has done a better job than many in this region of diversifying its revenues away from oil. So it's still relatively oil, it's still relatively oil dependent. But of course, sadly for the UAE, the, you know, one of the other key areas um, that it developed in order to get away from oil dependence was tourism and hospitality and F and B and logistics. You know, these are these are these are some of the other major sec sectors that uh, that it has worked on to uh, to to reduce its dependency on oil. And yet, these all happen to be areas um, that are in that are in themselves now struggling because of the impact of COVID-19 and, 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 and the trade and travel restrictions that have been put in place as a result. So I, I don't think that there is any other risk worth mentioning at the moment until such time as we're out of the woods on COVID-19. This is where it's out at the moment. This is where almost all government and corporate efforts are focused. Can we take one last question? Sure. How do you think this will affect international financing institutions' appetite to finance projects in developing countries? Yeah, um, I mean, particularly the question of developing countries. Um, you know, this this basically focuses the focuses everyone's attention on 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 the risk. Um, you know, we haven't yet seen any of those big high population developing economies severely hit yet by COVID-19. I mean, you know, as I mentioned, places like South Africa, um, places like Egypt, uh, you know, um, Indonesia as well, potentially, you know, big 300 million of populations. You know, these are, these are places that could expect in normal circumstances, pretty fast growth and pretty high returns for investors. Now, you know, high growth in emerging markets always comes with higher risk. I mean, that's the balance, right? You want you want higher returns, you accept higher levels of risk. Um, and you know, plainly any investor looks at uh, their risk reward ratio and thinks, well, you know, either either I'm, I accept that risk and, and take the reward uh, or, or I go for safer havens. The irony, of course, in the Middle East at the moment is that, you know, you've got high risk, but relatively low returns in any case. So, um, you know, that's a pretty toxic combination. So, you know, for the Middle East for a while now, we've seen um, pretty low returns and yet pretty high geopolitical risk. And, and, and I think that's why we've probably seen much lower levels of, uh, of FDI here, much lower levels of, of investment from corporates here. Um, you know, they've all pretty much taken their investments east. And they're looking at Asia where they can get higher returns and lower risk. So, Something like COVID, of course, changes the risk profile. It, 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 I think it reminds people that uh, the risks in, in developing markets um, are not just financial risk. I mean, you know, this is a health risk, uh, essentially. And, and these countries that are just ill-equipped to deal with COVID-19, if they suffer a severe outbreak, you know, will really put the brakes on those economies um, and... Uh, you know, and, and probably decimate them, them in the in the short term. And I think you know investors will have to pay attention to that as well because that's that's material. 
with this. Unfortunately, we have to end all the questions. We received a very high volume of questions, and I apologize for everyone for not being able to go through them all. But um, we will be. Uh, this session is recorded, and you will all receive the recording for the session, so you can go through it again, and perhaps if you know it can answer your questions. So with this, hey, I would uh, like. Hey, Bert, yeah. hey, Bert, if I just just very quickly. Um, yes. I will look through those questions. Um, one opportunity to answer some of those, and I'm seeing some good ones in there as well that probably do need a response. Uh, we, have okay. a, we, have another, we have another webinar tomorrow, the Economist Corporate Network webinar, um, in the company of our uh, regional editorial director for Middle East and Africa. It's two o'clock tomorrow, Dubai time, and we're going to be exploring in more depth uh, some of the uh, economic um, implications of COVID-19. And I might, uh, I, I'm interviewing uh, Pat and, uh, and I, I might put some of those questions to her then if you don't mind. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm happy to welcome any of you uh, to join that uh, tomorrow. If I, perhaps if I share the registration link with you, Heber, uh, you can yes. distribute that to some of the attendees today if they want okay. to join that and hear, hear more on some of the questions they've asked. Well, thank you so much, Robert, for this. So if anyone is interested to attend tomorrow's session, just drop me a quick message um, and then I will be able to send you the link so that you can register and attend it. Robert Willock, Director for Director of the MENA Region at the Economist Corporate Network, thank you very much for joining us and for the session today. Um, it was really valuable and um, we had more than 110 attendees attending this session. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to us. And during this time, we will continue to offer our suite of online webinars that can connect you to the ideas and the insights of the University of Manchester wider community and its partners from anywhere you are in the world. So stay tuned to our next webinars. Thank you again, Robert. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great and safe evening at home and do not leave your homes after 8 p.m if you are in dubai <laughs> so thank you all <laughs> thank you and we look forward to um receiving your questions thank you good night everyone good night robert and thank you again <laughs>